Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and very well welcome to this small function or event organized by Antara India. Don't ask me now what Antara is. There's a guy called Tarun Das sitting here, created lots of problems in CII, and now he's creating problems for other institutions. Anyway, before we start the event today, and it's just getting to be 10 o'clock, there's a three minute, just three minute film on CK. Leaders must lead. You cannot lead unless you are future oriented. Leadership is about the future. Leadership is about a point of view about the future. And in the last five years, I've been spending a lot of time looking at opportunities at the bottom of the pyramid. And the interesting thing is, if you start looking at a billion people, not as a problem, not as poverty elevation programs, not as government subsidies, but as a market, and then as a source of innovation, we have the most phenomenal opportunity in the world. We have the extraordinary opportunity to show the world how we can live with people who are different, whether it's religion, language, economic strength. How can we work together? How can we leverage each other and create a country that becomes the benchmark country for the rest of the world? To start this journey, I want you to accept three principles. First, we will make a dramatic change only if our aspirations are higher than our resources. The second, don't start from where you are. And the third, India cannot keep benchmarking others. Nobody in human history has tried this. So we have to have the confidence to say, we will create the next practice, not benchmark others for best practice. That I think is a very critical piece. We cannot follow somebody else. I believe that India has the opportunity to actively shape the emerging world order. This transformation of India and its competitiveness is not about intellect, it's not about analysis, it's about imagination. It's about a passion to make this country different. It's about courage. And it's a deep commitment to making life different for every Indian. It's about humanity and a lot of humility. And of course, some intellect and luck would always help. I wish you all the very best. Thank you very much. Good morning again. Uh, I'm getting younger day by day, so I no longer accept normally such engagements. But I'm really very happy and pleased to share today's event for four reasons. I knew CK fairly well for many, many years and respected his knowledge, experience, wisdom, and leadership. Dr. Rajan, who will deliver today's Memorial Lecture is someone whom I hold in very high regard. 
Three, I've been and continue to be associated with both the organizers, Ananta Center and, and CII. And finally, I mean, I don't know why or how, but I'm told that he is a keynote speaker, not me. So I'm not supposed to talk. I'm supposed to talk less and listen more. Difficult for me, but I'll try. <laughs> Professor C.K. Pralath, whose memory we honor today, and annually, CII and this one, CII and Tara, uh, we organize a memorial lecture, gave us many things for the Indian economy and Indian industry. A new self-confidence and self-esteem that we are competitive, but we can become more and more competitive. An aspiration to achieve a 10% GDP growth for the Indian economy, a strategy to grow and improve our manufacturing capabilities and competitiveness. A vision of the market opportunities and need for innovation to reach out to people, as we saw, especially at the low income levels. Good for them, but if you can do it well, good for the corporates, because the demand there can be infinite. A consciousness, very important in many countries, especially many emerging market countries, and in India, about the dangers of corruption and a dream of what India, and that's why we say India at 75, what India can be 75 years after independence is coming now. It's 2022. To mention you know, just a few points, his contributions are a huge legacy. Dr. Raghuram Rajan, to hear him or listen to him, I presume most of you are here, is someone we have been, quote unquote, chasing for over a year, difficult guy, I think, to deliver the C.K. Prahlad Memorial Lecture. Not only because of who he is, one of the world's leading economic thinkers, researchers, and writers. Not only because he is the head, the governor of the Reserve Bank of India, one of the most, if not the most important, independent, in independent, yes? Huh? independent institution for the well-being, being not only of our economy, for the nation as a whole, also because he knew CK well and they collaborated on writing policy papers for Dr. Manmohan Singh, then Prime Minister of India. We forget people. So lest we forget, we must record our appreciation of Dr. Manmohan Singh, he brought, as far as I know, Dr. Rajan to India and to RBI. Dr. Rajan's bio CV is with you. It is superfluous. The RBI's role and responsibility are widely known. I won't go into, I mean, you're tired of hearing about it. It's a thing called interest rate. I must admit, I mean, whether corporates benefit or not, I may say that my group companies, Bajaj Auto and all, I mean, Deepak Parikh doesn't like me saying many things, including this one. For 30 years, we have been lenders, not borrowers. So higher the rate of interest, good for me as a corporate. I don't borrow. So, I mean, I've seen close friends borrowing, leveraging. They ask me, didn't you go to business school? Didn't you learn the benefits of leveraging your equity? I said, yes, I see my friends. and I. To my friends, I quote their names. They can't sleep well. I sleep very well. What the hell do you do with debt? A little extra profit? No, no. Sorry, Deepak. I mean, no, sorry. But come. <laughs> so I won't go into that, but I, I must admit this. Other things being equal, even I believe. All of corporate customers, two motorcycles I made, the three wheelers I made, the customers will benefit categorically but not by him reducing his interest rates, by these guys. The government should tell the public sector banks to reduce. They passed on what, 35 paisa, BPS? What about the balance 75 which he reduced? Oh, jeb mein gaya. Deposit rate kam karege to bhagwan jane paisa kidar jayega. I don't understand this, I'm a manufacturing simple man, I don't understand finance. 
All I know is, uh, by mistake, I put the TV on yesterday. I came in from du uh, Dubai, and this girl called Janet Yellen didn't do nothing. With all the expectations built up, now, I don't know, maybe the governor will tell us good for India. Or I think it's not bad for India. So, okay. But I don't understand this. So he will tell us what it is if he wants to. I don't even know this reforms. Reforming the financial sector. I don't know what this means. Uh, but uh, we'll wait to listen to him. The foundation of the financial sector reforms should be safeguarded. If the Indian economy has to be stable, solid, and strong, especially our banks, especially those in the public sector, which do give us cause for anxiety. Financial sector reforms to an uninitiated person like me should be a continuous process so that they are aligned to and future ready. Let me just mention in passing four things and then I will close. The role of the financial sector reforms in my View should be one, align rules and requirements among the multiple regulators so as to simplify. Two, enable innovation and productivity in businesses for the benefit of customers, customers first, and of course also shareholders. Three, stabilize the regulatory environment. Create consistent and visible guidelines and reduce risk among market participants and in the overall system in general. <clears throat> and finally, I mean, there are many others, but I'm just mentioning four, I have no time. Upgrade skills, no, somebody, it's controversial to say this, upgrade skills within the regulators, you know, IRDA, SEBI, my friend Yuki Sena is not here. Uh, upgrade skills within the regulators through a healthy interaction and cross-pollination with participants in the private sector. We also need to accelerate financial sector reforms. The government comes in there in the picture with the introduction of the bankruptcy rule. Otherwise, the life goes, but the decision is not taken. I've said enough, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Raham Rajan, Governor of the Reserve Bank of India, to deliver the fourth C.K. Prahlad Memorial Lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bajaj, and distinguished guests, including the members of the press. Uh, Coimbatore Krishna Rao Prahlad was born in Tamil Nadu. He was one of nine children and obtained an undergraduate degree in physics from the University of Madras before going on to do an MBA from IIM Ahmedabad. He was part of the first batch there. Then went on to Harvard Business School, got a degree went to the University of Michigan, where he spent the rest of his life as an academic. In 1990, uh, he and Gary Hamill co-authored an article in the Harvard Business Review, which was entitled, The Core Competence of the Corporation. They were building on work, uh, I would guess, by Edith Penrose, uh, talking about the capabilities of the firm. But they brought this uh, to, to the public attention, stressing that uh, firms needed to define their unique capabilities, their core competencies, and focus on encouraging that uh, to cultivate those core competencies to make growth possible. They went on to write a book called Competing for the Future in uh, 1994, which established how uh, many market leaders like IBM, uh, by focusing too much on their existing customers, and maintaining leadership in the mainframe business had ignored totally the PC business and as a result uh, had lost out in, in the race. I think Clayton Christensen took this idea forward uh, later. Um, um, and perhaps most important to India, some of what you said, uh, saw Prahlad talking about. In 2005, his book, The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid, Eradicating Poverty Through Profits, explored how the bottom of the pyramid may actually be a profitable target market for businesses. And especially in India, it could be a source for growth as well as poverty alleviation. Much as uh, the term core competence has entered the lexicon, so too has bottom of the pyramid 
as a target market. Prahlad uh, received many awards and honors during his lifetime, but Professor Prahlad's greatest honor is probably the continuing influence of his work. Now, I met uh, Professor Prahlad when I was at the University of Chicago, uh, and I have to say, despite his enormous reputation and the very exalted circles he moved in, saw some of the people he, he knew on, on the screen, he's always down to earth and immensely insightful. He cared deeply about India and gave freely of his time and money to make a difference here. Many of you have attended the seminars he organized to improve Indian business practice. He believed that Indians were second to none. And some of the businessmen here have taken his message to heart and actually delivered high quality businesses which are the best in the world. Now, we never got a chance to do research together, but we did write a joint letter to the then Prime Minister in 2009, together with Professor Abhijit Banerjee of MIT, advocating, amongst other steps, accelerated efforts to bring out a unique ID in India. Perhaps, therefore, we all three had a small role in the Prime Minister setting up the unique ID authority headed by Nandan Nilekani. Now, as an aside, given how far Nandan's UIDAI has taken us towards a universal unique ID for India, it would be sad if its use was severely restricted. Other countries like the United States have used unique IDs, such as social security numbers, without serious allegations of violation of privacy. Learning from worldwide experience, we need to see how we can satisfy the concerns of the Supreme Court without undermining the use and value of the unique ID. For the unique ID can en enable a variety of economically valuable activities that particularly benefit C.K. Pillard's bottom of the pyramid. For instance, not only can it expand the access of the poor and the young to credit, as they use the collateral of their future good name to borrow today. It also allows regulators like us to detect and curb overborrowing to individuals by asking lenders to report unique IDs of borrowers to credit bureaus. Today, unscrupulous lenders can avoid current regulations against overlending by simply misreporting the borrower's name or address. That gets solved if they had to report the unique ID. Similarly, as you know, the government has used the UID to weed out duplicate beneficiaries for various welfare schemes, thus enabling better targeting of scarce funds to the very poor. So I truly believe that C.K. Prahlad would want us to find a way to move forward with UIDs. Now let me turn to the uh, centerpiece of my talk, and I think uh, Mr. Bajaj has uh, previewed much of what I want to say, so I'll just elaborate on what he said. Uh, I do believe, uh, as C.K. did, that India can be far more successful and influential than it is today. The question is, what do we need to do to succeed? How can we compete effectively against the best? Do we really need to identify our core competencies as a nation? Now, rather than speak from the perspective of business, which many of you are far better positioned to do, let me speak from the vantage point of a central banker. Now, I know these cameras are all here not to hear me speak about core competencies, but to hear my views on interest rates. So let me offer my standard disclaimer. For any hints on what we will do in the upcoming policy statement, please read the guidance in our last policy statement. <laughs> and I will quote, significant uncertainty will be resolved in the coming months, including the likely persistence of recent inflationary pressures, the full monsoon outturn, as well as possible Federal Reserve actions, which I guess we know didn't happen. As the Reserve Bank awaits greater transmission of its front-loaded past actions, it will monitor developments for emerging room for more accommodation. Now, let me advise that nothing I say in what follows is meant to offer further guidance, and please don't read veiled meaning where none is intended. Okay, with that, if we look around the world today, I think it would be fair to say it doesn't present a pretty picture. Industrial countries are still struggling, with a few exceptions to grow, and uncertainty about growth in the United States, as well as the world, is probably what 
what uh, impelled the Fed to stay on hold yesterday. Our fellow BRICS have all got deep problems. Indeed, India appears to be an island of calm in an ocean of turmoil. So what is different and how can be, uh, we be assured that it will continue? Perhaps Brazil offers a salutary lesson. Only a few years ago, the world was applauding Brazil's strong growth, its thriving democracy, and the enormous strides it was making in reducing inequality uh, with its Bolsa Familia program. It grew at 7.6% in 2010 and had also discovered huge undersea oil reserves, which the then President Lula likened to finding a lottery ticket. Yet this year, the country is expected to shrink by 3%, and its debt just got downgraded to junk. So what went wrong? Now, paradoxical as it may seem, uh, Brazil tried to grow too fast. The 7.6% came on the backs of substantial stimulus after the global financial crisis. And in an attempt to keep growth at that high level, the New York Times says the central bank was pressed to reduce interest rates fueling a credit spree that overburdened customers are only now struggling to re repay. Further, Brazil's government funded a development, Brazil's government funded development bank, that is BNDES, hugely increased subsidized loans to corporations. Certain industries were favored with tax breaks while price controls were imposed on gasoline and electricity, causing huge losses in public sector firms and a collapse in investment in those areas. Petrobras, the national oil company, which was supposed to make the tremendous investments in oil drilling, instead became embroiled in a corruption scandal. Even as government pensions burned an ever bigger hole in the government budget, budget deficit expanded for other reasons, and the political consensus to narrow them has become elusive. As a result, foreign investors have gotten worried. Brazil's currency has depreciated significantly over the last year. Now, undoubtedly, Brazil's authorities are working hard to rectify the situation, but let's take away the lessons that their experience suggests. I think the fundamental point it, it, it makes is, in this difficult environment, growth has to be obtained the right way. It is possible to grow too fast with substantial stimulus, as we did in 2010 and 2011 only to, to pay the price in higher inflation, higher deficits, and lower growth in 2013 and 2014. So our own experience suggests that we have to be careful. Now, of course, India is not in the same situation today. Much has changed since those days. But with the world being an inhospitable place, we have to work hard to strengthen our current recovery and put it on a more sustainable footing. And while monetary policy will accommodate to the extent there is room, we have to expand the sustainable growth potential. And that means continuing to implement the reforms that the government and regulators have announced. That's the only way we get sustainable growth potential up. Now, these reforms are intended to strengthen the environment for doing business and to expand access to financing. And these will, in turn, allow our companies to find and exploit their core competencies that CK talks so much about. Now for us at the RBI, the key tasks are to keep inflation low, not just today, but well into the future so that we get moderate nominal interest rates that satisfy not just the very vocal borrowers, but also the silent saver. It has to be something that satisfies both, otherwise one side goes on strike. We also need to clean up the banking system of distressed assets so that it's in a position to fund growth again. Now, while we understand the difficulties that industry has and will work as hard as we can on improving the business environment, India must resist special interest pleas for targeted stimulus, additional tax breaks and protections, directed credit, subventions and subsidies, all of which have historically rendered industry uncompetitive government overextended, and the country incapable of regaining its rightful position amongst nations. We have to create the business environment. But then business has to run on its own footing, and not because of privilege, because it creates 
effective business. And I think many in this room have shown it is possible. Now, what will be critical in success, as the Prime Minister said earlier this month while meeting industrialists and bankers, is that business has to believe in the tremendous possibilities and opportunities the nation has and be willing to take the investment risk that will generate returns. CK said it in the, in the movie when he said, we have to have imagination to think of the possibilities and to exploit them. No country succeeds without believing in itself. I don't mean the unwarranted belief that we are intrinsically better than everyone else because of our history, but the confidence that given our population, our demographics, a massive infrastructure investment opportunities and the wide range of capabilities in our people, the arc of history is turning towards us. Now, while Indian business has been hurt by public authorities' acts of omission and commission in the past, I think it's fair to acknowledge it, we have to look forward. And I have no doubt that as business presses people in positions of public responsibility, like myself and others, to make the changes needed to ease doing business, we will respond. Let me turn to what we are trying to do on the environment in the financial sector and what more we need to do. Let me dwell specifically on four things. You will see why I said uh, Mr. Bajaj had already spelled them out. We need to dwell on the need to foster competition and innovation, on creating an environment hospitable to those who don't belong to the club, on improving the structures we have to deal with distress, and on strengthening the human capital in the financial sector, of course, in the regulator also. So let me expand on these four issues. First, competition and innovation. Now, in order to get more growth, we need more competition, especially from new entrants who are in a better position to reach hitherto excluded portions of our economy. I'm glad to report that after a decade of no new entry, we will see two new private banks this year, one of which has already opened, and a large number of payment banks and small finance banks next year. Licensing for banks is to go on tap. Now, some incumbents have expressed fears about unfair competition. Competition is unfair only if it's not on the same playing field. In fact, the new entrants we have licensed have no new privileges that incumbents do not already enjoy. In fact, they have, some of them have fewer. We hope, though, that the new entrants will find innovative ways of giving customers better services at lower prices, the emphasis on customers that Mr. Bajaj said, thus shaking up and changing the banking sector for the better. Now, we regulators are typically a conservative lot. It's good that we are, else there would be no speed breakers in the economy to slow down its propensity to get into trouble. But we also should not stand in the way of innovation. There's a Chinese saying, cross the river by feeling the stones. We have to follow that path of experimentation and incremental liberalization. Feeling each stone each time, but not stopping from crossing. We have to cross. So for example, as increasingly innovative new services want their customers to have the ability to make payments quickly, we've allowed small value card payments without the two-factor th authentication that protects many of you when you make large payments. As we and financial institutions gain experience, and as new technologies ensuring security emerge, we will liberalize further. More generally, our philosophy as regulators is to allow innovation in institutions, instruments, and practices so long as they don't present a clear and present danger. Once we understand them better and they grow to a material size, we can do a deeper analysis on how they should be regulated. Similarly, we have been allowing more and more participation in derivative markets by what are typically known as speculators, those without an underlying risk they are hedging. Speculators are people who don't have the underlying risk and are taking positions. 
Now, these speculators are much maligned in India and are often confused with market manipulators. It's important to emphasize the two are different. A speculator takes a position in an instrument and thus takes risks, much as an investor in a stock takes risks. They are needed to take the other side to the hedges, otherwise there's no depth in the market. And if there's no depth, depth prices would be distorted. By contrast, the market manipulator moves thin markets in a preferred direction so as to make a quick profit. And this is in contrast to the speculator who simply takes a side that she thinks will make money. So in the securities we regulate, we intend to encourage broader participation while, where we can, discouraging manipulation. So depth, but not manipulation. More generally, we would like to improve regulation by focusing on what is absolutely necessary to create a sound business environment. Focusing on enabling regulation rather than paternalistic regulation. But we also intend to enforce everything that's on the books. If we have it on the books, it must be necessary, and therefore it has to be enforced. We will trust but we will also verify. To this extent, or to this end, we are streamlining all our regulations by the end of the year into new master documents which, you which should be placed on the internet and updated on a real-time basis. Many of you complain that there are various circulars coming all the time. You don't know where the entire sort of lot is and you don't know what happened in history. We're gonna put all this together in one master document which is cross-referenced so you can find out for your particular need, what are the regulations that apply? And that master document will be updated so that you know exactly what to do on a real-time basis. Now that was as far as innovation goes. Let me turn to including outsiders. Now as India grows, financial sector participants will grow beyond the insiders who typically dominate economic activity in the early stages of growth of any country. Outsiders and new entrants will want access, arms length contracts they can trust, and a dispute settlement system that is transparent and predictable. And by outsiders, I mean the range of people who don't take part in financial services, including people from outside the country who come in and participate in our markets. Now, as far as access goes, the, 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 the key uh, need is to bring people who have been excluded to participate in the financial system. Only then will we get sustainable growth. If people are left out, at some point they will rebel against the growth that is happening because they're not part of this, the growth process. The Prime Minister's Jandhan Yojana has created accounts for much of the excluded population, and the government is taking the next step of attaching a variety of financial services, such as accident and life insurance, to these accounts, and sending direct benefits, such as scholarships, pensions, and subsidies, to these accounts. Now, we need to go further by increasing access to these bank accounts through business correspondence, payment banks, and point of sale machines so that they're used frequently. Accounts which are not used are not very useful. Easy payments, access to cash and cash out facilities, and widespread availability of savings instruments across the country has to be our next objective in the financial inclusion of households. We also need to ease lending to small producers, whether they're farmers, self-help groups, or small businesses. For this, we need to improve the structure and working of credit information bureaus, collateral registries, and debt recovery tribunals. Ironically, credit flows easily only when the lender is persuaded that he'll get his money back. So easier access to credit necessitates harsher consequences of default, loss of reputation, loss of collateral, and so on. Perhaps the most important source of collateral is land. We need better digital mapping and clean records of land ownership across the country so that land can be used more effectively as collateral. And I'm glad to say a number of states are taking up the issue of mapping land so that in fact it can serve as collateral. Now newcomers to the system and outsiders rely not on relationships to get done, they have none to speak of, but on arm's length auctions and contracts enforced quickly by an impartial bureaucracy and judiciary. This is why the cleanup that is taking place in methods of allocating resources like mines and spectrum 
and attempts to improve the speed of bureaucratic and judicial decision making are all much needed to increase participation, though we need to continue doing much more over time. Any reforms we do ha also have to be institutionalized so that they live on beyond the life of the reformer. Finally, newcomers and outsiders need protection against unfair practices. As one example of what, what we're doing, RBI has developed a charter of consumer rights following public consultation. Now, instead of creating regulation on this basis, we handed the charter over to bank boards and told them to put in place frameworks that ensure those rights are protected. Now, we're giving them time. We're giving them a year to try and do this on their own. After they've been in operation for some time, we'll call them together and find out what's happening and take a view on best practices and regulation if any is needed. In the meantime, of course, we're trusting, but we're also verifying field visits by our, the RBI to check mis-selling as well as the profitable functioning of bank infrastructure such as, such as branches and ATMs will be expanded. We need to figure out how to, for example, on the issue of ATMs, make sure ATMs that are out there are actually working and that's something we will spend more time on. Finally, let me turn to distress. Uh, failure is inevitable in the free enterprise system. It's not just because you fail doesn't mean you're, you're a bad apple. It means things went wrong. Maybe it could be just luck. What we need is an effective resolution system which is needed to preserve the residual enterprise value after failure. Two critical elements in this are speed of resolution and predictability of how losses are shared amongst contracts. We need both. We need fast resolution to put the asset back on track, otherwise long periods will destroy the value of the asset, long periods under resolution. The second, people have to know when they put their money in initially how they will be treated in distress. There has to be predictability of the contract. For instance, few outsiders are gonna willing, be willing to lend debt which has its upside capped, if they know that in trouble they will be shared or even subordinated to promoter interests. If debt becomes equity in bad times but stays debt in good times, this is not a good sharing of risks, at least certainly not what the contract promised. So we need a speedy bankruptcy code to resolve distress while maintaining the priority structure of claims. And I'm glad that the finance ministry intends to bring one in soon. This bankruptcy code will give creditors more ability to resolve distress and help strengthen the corporate bond market, which will be so needed for the enormous infrastructure uh, demands that are coming. In the meantime, we have to find ways to deal with distress in the banking system without the benefit of an effective bankruptcy code. Regulatory forbearance where the RBI softens its rules on classifying bad loans only makes it easy for banks to extend and pretend. It's not a solution. Since no other stakeholder, such as the promoter, tariff authorities, tax authorities, etc., contributes to the resolution, what happens with extend and pretend is the project limps along, deterior or deteriorating along the way, and becoming increasingly unviable. Meanwhile, Analysts grow increasingly suspicious of bank balance sheets and the growing volume of quote-unquote restructured standard loans. Also, some large promoters take advantage of banker fears about assets turning non-performing to extract unwarranted concessions without any sacrifice in the value of their stake. So regulatory forbearance not only gives the whole process a bad name, it also ensures that problems grow until the size of the provisioning required to deal with the problem properly becomes alarmingly large, which then prompts calls for yet more forbearance. So this is not a workable solution. Forbearance is also a disservice to the bank's owners, which could include the government, who instead of being faced with a small problem early and being given the opportunity to apply corrective action, are faced with large problems suddenly when they cannot be pushed any longer into the future. Therefore, we ended forbearance accorded to restructured loans, 
Henceforth, restructured loans will be called non-performing. That's not the end of the world. That doesn't mean banks can't lend to these projects to put them back on track. It just means that from an accounting perspective, it has to be recognized as non-performing and banks have to provision more. However, at the same time as we've tried to clean up the accounting of these loans, insisting once again that non-performing doesn't mean you can't lend further to it, we've also introduced more flexibility for banks to deal with stress, to recognize and deal with stress early. We have started an early warning database of large loans which alerts banks. We have the Joint Lender Forum, which gets banks together so that a solution can be crafted outside of a formal bankruptcy system. We have the strategic debt restructuring process, which allows banks to take more equity. So rather than have a highly overlevered project, they can take some equity in the project. We have the 525 mechanism, which allows them to st stretch payments over time for projects with a long life. All these should be seen as giving banks the flexibility to deal with the stressed asset problem in the absence of a functioning bankruptcy code, even while bringing more urgency and discipline to dealing with the problem. Now, of course, some people criticize our easing the way for restructuring. The other day I was having my breakfast and a gentleman accosted me saying, while he was paying his debt regularly, his competitor who had siphoned money out of the firm through over invoicing was getting his debt written down because it was unpayable. Now, this is a reality, but you know, some firms have gotten into trouble for because they over-invoiced and siphoned money out, but I would say that this is only one of a variety of reasons why firms got into trouble, and we have to deal with firms getting into trouble no matter why they got into trouble. Now, wherever possible, of course, promoters should share fully in the cost of restructuring. But the restructuring process is not meant to deal with criminality. Siphoning money out of a business is a crime against lenders and investors and should be dealt with as such by the investigative agencies. However, the original sin of over-invoicing should not be a reason to keep idle the spanking new plant and to let its workers go. And that is why restructuring is very important. No matter what the reason the firm has got into trouble, let's put the real asset back on track and working for the benefit of all. That's what we should focus on. The other issues should not be ignored, but there are other agencies to take care of them, and they should be doing their job. Again, uh, in an environment which is reasonable and doesn't inspire fear in good, uh, well-intentioned business. Um, finally, uh, we need to develop human capital. Uh, we need many more finance professionals with s specific skills for the enormous financing that lies ahead. I know there are a number of you in the audience. We need many more. Today, too many of our project decisions are made by banks listening to the same set of consultants, which means that too few independent views get embedded in the evaluation decision. And ironically, it's the same set of consultants who are called back when the project goes bad to advise on how to put, pro put the project back on track. Banks need to have these skills in-house so that they are not forced to follow the herd. And this problem is probably most acute in public sector banks, but not uh, only there. Now, the quick way is for our public sector banks to recruit talent from the market. Now, while the challenges of making a mark in the public sector may attract some to top public sector positions, for subordinate positions, it may be essential to pay a market wage. And the cost of paying this wage may be small when set against the enormous national benefit of, making, of allowing these banks to make better decisions. Of course, the bulk of public sector bank promotions will continue to come from in-house talent. Also, poaching talent from other banks is a zero-sum game for the system, and the system needs more people. So our banks will have to develop skills in-house by training staff, not so much the soft skills, which they're, they're doing plenty of training on, but hard skills, such as risk management capabilities and project evaluation capabilities. Now, at the RBI, in our development role, we are attempting to help strengthen the human capital in the financial system. Some of our teaching units, as the, such as the College of Agriculture and Banking, 
and the Staff College have been tra training bankers in important areas such as agricultural lending and MSME lending. Increasingly, our Center for Advanced Financials Research and Learning, that is CAFRAL, will provide courses in state-of-the-art financial techniques such as pro project evaluation, structuring, and resolution of distress, as well as risk management. Now, banks have to pool resources to set up their own facilities. This is not enough, but they could also press CAFRAL to do more for them. But, but we need many more uh, ways of training up the human capital in our system. Let me conclude. I, I have described some of the ways I think we can position the financial system towards, towards sustainable growth. In, um, you know, to, to respect the points made by C.K. Prilad, let me ask one last question. Um, in the same way as firms have core competencies, do countries have core competencies? And how do we get them there? Now, I'm going to punt a little on the answer by saying I don't know if countries have core competencies. Perhaps they do, perhaps they don't. But it's very hard for public authorities to determine what they are in the face of massive lobbying and disinformation from interested parties. If we actually go out and say we want to focus on national core competencies, every industry will be out there to show how it thoroughly fits the bill. In the same way as every industry today wants to tell us why they especially deserve special tax benefits or interest subventions or the appellation of infrastructure. Remember, the license permit Raj persisted precisely because some industries were favored over others in the so-called national interest. So even if nations have core competencies, my point is it's going to be very hard to determine what they are and extremely easy to succumb to vested interests in supporting the wrong ones. Better, therefore, to focus on creating an enabling environment and let the core competencies emerge from the fillip given by the environment. In other words, let firms determine where they want to go and show the way. Let us focus on just creating the environment. Remember, the IT sector emerged as a result of the investment the country made in technical education as well as the role of our public sector firms, electronics firms, BEL, and so on, which nurtured capacity in IT. And then, Individuals went out and started IT firms without any special encouragement by the government. In fact, by the, by the time the government turned to look at IT, it was too late. It had already emerged as a strong industry. So let, let me conclude. Uh, C.K. Prahlad believed Indian business was capable of scaling world heights, and so do I. But there are no easy ways to the top. Jugard or working around difficulties by hook or by crook is a thoroughly Indian way of coping, but it's predicated on a difficult or impossible business environment. And it encourages an attitude of shortcuts and evasions, none of which help final product quality or sustainable economic growth. We should salute the entrepreneurial abilities of our business people who have succeeded in very difficult business environments, but it is better for us to change the environment for the better. And that is what we are trying to do. Now, all this requires patience. The current difficulties of emerging markets stem from a complicated set of reasons, but an important one is the impatience to regain growth by overemphasizing old and ineffective methods of stimulus. Brazil may have overspent, China may have overinvested, and look where they are now. The world is a difficult place. Let us recognize we're doing quite well, not great, quite well in comparison. Indeed, many di industries in difficulty have a problem, not because domestic demand is really very low, but because exports are low and imports are very competitive. I don't want to rule out the role of domestic demand. We need to boost it. But let us also uh, take let us accept the fact that we are in a difficult environment. We cannot compensate entirely for what is happening across our borders, else we'll risk acquiring the problems our fellow emerging markets have. We have to have the discipline to stick to our strategy of building the necessary institutions and creating a new path of sustainable growth where Jugard is no longer needed. 
For this, we need the understanding and cooperation of business, not impatience and pressure for quick, impossible fixes. Only then do I believe we will realize a true potential as a nation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is it working? Thank you very much, Dr. Rajan, for a comprehensive uh, and, as expected, uh, both informative and interesting uh, uh, talk. Uh, may I start? I mean, you covered it directly and indirectly, but uh, by asking you two questions, and then we'll throw it open. Depending on when you want to go, I mean, our time is till 11 o'clock uh, to the floor. And I'll give them some notice so they can frame their questions. After my two questions, I would request maybe Deepak and Adi to ask questions. My two questions, uh, Governor, are uh, one, is it a huge amount of uh, government borrowing or what are the reasons why India is finding it look so difficult to develop a long-term bond market? And second, to which I made a reference earlier in my welcome remarks, in your view, why are the banks, including Deepak's bank, well, I like him very much. Mm, he's involved in the bank also, apart from the housing finance company. Why aren't they passing on the reductions you have made? Reduction in margin is their fear, because they can't reduce the spread, they can't reduce their cost, even the private sector. Or as I said, is it, uh, the alternative is to reduce the rate of interest. Where will the money go away? It will stay in India, no, by and large, if you deposit money. So India won't lose. So what's your view on that? These two questions, and then we'll throw it open to them. Sure, um, very good questions. First, uh, on the government bond, uh, on the corporate bond market, I don't think it's so much crowding out by the government, though, uh, I mean, the real issue is confidence in, uh, in investing. Um, what we see in the bond market is typically only the very highly rated investors can issue bonds uh, in the open market. Uh, the A and uh, AAA and AA investors, uh, issuers in India. Uh, most of the rest do private placements, uh, and they don't go below a certain quality there also. So, People are scared of investing in corporate bonds because uh, presumably part of it has to do with uh, lower levels of information about the companies, but also lower ability to have sense that they'll get their money back. Um, our, we don't have a good bankruptcy system which protects the bondholder in times of distress. Banks, of course, have recourse to things like Sarfesi to protect their interests, but even there, there's, uh, there's, there's a limit. So investors want to put their money in only the safest public sector bond issuers or the safest private sector bond issuers and not go outside. I think the bankruptcy code will make a big difference because it will give people a sense that in bankruptcy, value is preserved. The loss given default is not 100%, it's significantly lower. And that will then, I think, be a fillip to the corporate bond market. There are other things that are being contemplated uh, including possible repoing of corporate bonds with the central bank as a means to get liquidity. These are things that are being contemplated, but I think uh, what is central is not the minor fixes, but the bankruptcy code, and that will make a huge difference. Um, the second uh, question you asked is why banks are not passing things on. Well, I have to say that uh, Mr. <laughs> Parekh's <laughs> bank did pass on uh, another 30 uh, basis points, which came as a shock to the banking system because it was an outlier in doing more. Um, I think there are a, a few reasons. One, uh, their cost base doesn't adjust as quickly. There are, there's some overnight and short-term borrowing they have which adjust because the short-term interest rate has come down. But the longer-term deposits take time to adjust. Now, um, typically in other countries, banks have asset liability management which ensures 
that if much of their lending is floating rate lending, the liability side is also effectively floating rate after asset liability management. In India, we haven't done that as much. So banks are waiting for their deposit rates to come down, and some of their deposits don't reprice quickly because they're five-year deposits, four-year deposits. So as a result, their cost base stays higher for longer. And I think the banks that do more asset liability management can pass it on more quickly. We're trying to nudge them through regulations to move towards that, to move towards a base rate which is initially marginal cost pricing and then eventually based on market benchmarks like LIBOR. In, in the US, no bank sets its own benchmark. It does it off the market benchmark. We've started now issuing market benchmarks through an organization. Over time, as there's a sense that this is reliable, banks will move to that and then they will have to be forced to do asset liability management. The other thing I keep telling the banks is, look, the longer you stay with your current lending rates, the more the markets are eating your lunch for you. Because more and more large corporations are borrowing from the market, issuing commercial paper, rather than borrowing from the banks. So this will go on for some time, but eventually they'll have to make a choice. And they will, uh, the, the other point is they're waiting for credit to pick up, so that the, uh, loss on the margins that they're making is made up by the volume of the new loans that they will get. So let us see. I think it's a matter of time before they pass it on. Uh, there is tremendous pressure on the banks from different sides, as you know, on their profitability. So one has to have a little bit of sympathy with them. But the fast-moving banks are putting pressure, and I think the markets are putting pressure, so transmission will take place. Thank you. Deepak? Uh, Mike, please. A couple of points, uh, Mr. Governor, on the, you know, distressed assets in the banking sector is a main, major concern, and you, are, you have outlined, and both the government, the finance ministry, and the RBI have done a number of innovative steps. <coughs> but a couple of things which I think, and I'd like to know your view, the asset reconstruction companies that we have in India are very thinly capitalized. They've been started by investment banks, brokers, we don't have a strong asset management company. Many years ago, um, between State Bank, ICICI, HDFC, we started RCIL, but somewhere along the line, it sort of collapsed and it didn't do well. Uh, the capital of existing ARCs are very thin. When they try and buy an asset from the banking sector, they go the next day to borrow money in the market or they go to Rahul Bajaj to get money from. Um, so how do we set up a strong, deep, high capitalized asset reconstruction company who can pay cash and get the asset and then let some private sector executives manage those assets, sell it, piecemeal it, uh, revive it, and do whatever is necessary. And the second point I have is, do you think we could ever consider a good bank and a bad bank? My, my strong view is that in a public sector bank, at least as a pilot project, we should look at a good bank and a bad bank and let the good bank then continue growing and let's segregate the assets into a separate SPV and let some, again, people in different industries who are experts in that, whether it's textiles or leather or whatever, infrastructure, let them manage these bad assets over a period of time to make it better and then the good bank can buy it back. Or, you know, uh, as America and UK and all, in, 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 in UK what has happened is the, public, uh, the government has took equity, large equity in private banks and they made a lot of money in it. In our case, the government already has a large equity in many public sector banks. So that, that way is not possible, but we have to find a way where we can uh, have at least in one public sector bank, a good, bad bank and an experiment. Um, both uh, very interesting points. On the ARCs, uh, I'm very much for uh, adding capital to them. There is one clause which prevents the promoter from taking more than a certain stake in the ARC. We certainly uh, would be open to looking at it. We've, urged the we have, we've sent a number of proposals to the government. Government is interested. Let's see what we can do to make the ARCs more effective. I think we're absolutely right. We need to do that. Uh, the other possibility is private equity, where the private equity can take more of a role, as you said, in managing some of these distressed assets and uh, bringing new management in. And uh, a third possibility is um, 
the government has been thinking of a private-public kind of partnership. Now, in many of these distress situations, one has to be very careful to not be seen as doing sweet deals with the, uh, with the promoter. And I worry very much about an environment where the government has a majority stake in an entity, does one of these deals and gets hauled up. Uh, that will be the end of the re resolution process uh, because in many of these there are judgment calls. And in an environment of great suspicion, judgment calls uh, tend to be hard to make. So either you get paralysis or paralysis is induced by an exposed investigation of what happened. So I would rather that there be private sector players with strong incentives, a lot of skin in the game, with perhaps some public money backing them, and government has been talking about these, uh, which then go out and do some of these reconstructions, and then hopefully uh, come out on, you know, with adequate returns over time. Now for this also, the banks have to be prepared to part with assets at a reasonable price. And that means recognizing the true loss already which is one reason why uh, government and the RBI were very keen on recapitalizing the banks so that they could also clean up the balance sheets and take the hit to capital that would be needed in some of these situations by recognizing the true value of the loss if it's not already provisioned for. Uh, that leads to the good bank, bad bank. Now, the bad bank structure was uh, very useful in cases where there was a liquidating entity. You weren't gonna put more money in you are just going to take the money out of existing entities or sell them elsewhere, et cetera. Um, I'm not sure that uh, the bulk of our assets of that kind, more of them need sort of cooperation amongst the lender, including perhaps new loans to finish the project. So whether we can have a effective bad bank, I don't know. The, the other issue comes in pricing again if the loans are priced too low in selling to the bad bank and the bad bank makes money and the bad bank is, bad bank is not fully owned by the good bank, then there's a question of you know, uh, audit and uh, you know, investigation. Uh, on the other hand, if the bad bank is fully owned by the good bank, then you're not taking it off balance sheet, so there's no point. So how do you manage this difficult structure? Uh, so that's why I haven't been high, you know, strongly enthusiastic Rather, let's make the banks clean up themselves. And especially you mentioned the UK. Here, there's no such problem. The government already owns the problem. The government owns the banks, owns the problem. There's no question of transferring it to the public balance sheet. The key question is how do we diminish uh, and minimize losses to the public balance sheet? Thank you. Dr. Rajan, the very large differential between wholesale price index inflation and consumer price index inflation, I would just like to hear what is your view on the reason for that and is it creating problems in economic policy and performance? Um, it certainly is a source of, of problems. It's, it's a source of differentiation amongst different segments of the economy. Uh, it goes to that initial point I made about savers and, and borrowers. Uh, many of our borrowers are industrial borrowers. Uh, they face not much growth in output prices because they're, uh, they're basically operating in the traded goods sector. Uh, now, the problem is not as bad as it's made out to be. They certainly aren't able to charge higher prices, but their input costs have also come down tremendously. I mean, the cost of commodities has probably fallen much more than the cost of the final product. So margins haven't deteriorated to the extent suggested by the whole price, uh, wholesale price inflation. So when people tell me sometimes, let me add the wholesale price inflation index, which is strongly negative, to the nominal interest rate to get the real interest rate that people are facing, uh, I don't quite buy that. But nevertheless, it is a source of difficulty. And it comes precisely because the world is in disinflation or deflation in some situations. And that's transmitted wholly to the traded goods sector. Now, the consumer price inflation picks up non-traded goods, services. Uh, services like banking, services like construction which are not affected as much by the global uh, sort of uh, uh, turmoil in, in prices. And as a result, that has still remained reasonably high. Some of our services are still uh, growing in prices uh, at six, seven percent. So that causes a discrepancy because your consumer who's gonna save 
sees six or seven percent and wants a return over and above that. The 3.6 that we got last month is, I think, rendered un excessively low by base effects. If you add back the base effects, it's about mid fives. We know about mid fives for consumer price, negative two or three for wholesale price. That's a huge difference. And it does create differences in how different segments of the population view interest rates. The borrowers are hurting, especially the borrowers in the industrial sector. The savers are also hurting. They're saying, I mean, yesterday uh, in the meeting that we were at, uh, you know, the depositor uh, is saying that I used to get 10%, now I'm getting eight. Uh, who's going to compensate me? And you want to tell them you are getting compensated because inflation is much lower. At 10, you were getting negative real rates. Today, you're getting positive real rates. But they don't, they're looking at nominal. And so I think these are difficulties that we need to balance over time. Thank you. Uh, it's already 11 o'clock, so I will not take time for my word of thanks. I'll just thank and definitely not even try to summarize, which some people do, what the governor said. I'll take three questions here. After that, that can go to the gentleman here. And the third one, I'm sorry I can't come there, uh, Ashok Advani, after that. So, Dr. Rajan, uh, my question is on uh, you you Ninath Karpe from Aptec, your educational company. Uh, my question is on, uh, you mentioned about human capital and the economic reforms and the structure. We have heard this, uh, read recent news reports of you know, 2.3 million people applying for 400 jobs, some of them being doctorates and applying for jobs of tunes. And a month back, again, another 2 million had applied for 13,000 jobs. Is this a structural economic problem which cannot generate so many jobs? Or is it a social problem or a scaling problem? And how, what do you see the long-term solution of this? We cannot have a situation of millions of people applying for you know, 200 jobs. You know, the answer is we have to work on all sides. We have to grow more jobs, right? And those, we have to grow good jobs. And uh, the uh, problem about government jobs is they're very, uh, they, s they have a high status in our society. They're also very stable. They provide medical benefits. They do a lot of, they provide the housing in some cases. So they look very attractive compared to private sector jobs. And typically at lower levels, government pays much more than the private yeah, sector. So what we need to do is grow more good jobs and grow more pr productive jobs. Uh, and for that, I think we try and fix the environment and business has to take it forward. So business has to uh, have the confidence that the environment will be hospitable for it to do the investments that it needs. And so uh, from government and regulatory side, it is creating that predictable environment from businesses' side, it is having the confidence to invest, to take risks. So I don't think there's a shortcut to that. We, we just need to move forward. Introduce yourself, please, and brief question. Royston from Grameen. Uh, at the outset, uh, Grameen possibly is one of the best examples of someone really putting into practice the fortune at the bottom of the pyramid. So I would like to congratulate you on the Small Finance Bank Initiative, but also would like to offer a humble perspective on a comment you made you said accounts that are not used are often not very useful. Maybe the other way to look at it is if they are not very useful, they are not used. And therefore, what are we doing to be able to make them useful? You suggested scholarships and subsidies going in. But coming out of the Andhra crisis, another problem is over borrowing. How do we see moving to one UID type platform rather than ration card, voter ID, and over complicating the process which could lead to another possible problem? No, a, a very good point. I think we need to move to that right now. I think the hesitancy is with the uh, uncertainty based on the Supreme Court ruling. We are trying to get more clarity. S I don't think the Supreme Court intended to stand in the way of the voluntary usage of UIDs, but let us, let us clarify and then see how we can use it in, in some of the very important initiatives to protect the poor that you mentioned. Ashok Advani from Business India. Uh, you talked about the corporate bond market. Every governor of the Reserve Bank for the last 30 years has been talking about developing a corporate bond market. Yet at the same time, over the last 20 years, the Reserve Bank and the authorities have in effect killed off two options for the general public. One is fixed deposits used to be very popular as an instrument of saving and where investors got higher returns. But for all practical purposes, no companies issue fixed deposits today. And similarly, NBFCs, which created a whole range of credit options and borrowing options for the, uh, and lending options for the investors have been killed off by the Reserve Bank over the last 10 years for all practical purposes. So um, 
those are deposits. And uh, the problem with the NBFC deposits were they were effectively, they could be withdrawn at a moment's notice uh, by taking a hit on the interest rate. So effectively, they became demand deposits. And if you are issuing demand deposits, there's a systemic issue associated with you because if you're not doing well, you could have a run. And so that was a concern with the, uh, with the uh, NBFCs issuing demand deposits. For uh, corporations, we haven't come in the way of corporations issuing demand. Even for NBFCs, they're still de depositing NBFCs. We haven't encouraged their, their growth. Banks can issue fixed deposits and, and uh, people can invest in them. But I think we need to push on the corporate bond market. And we actually have uh, tried to facilitate that process. Uh, two recent uh, sort of initiatives there. One is a non-initiative in a sense and one is an initiative. Non-initiative is we haven't expanded access to the government bond market to foreign portfolio investors. As a result, more of them have gone into the corporate bond market, which has created a little more liquidity there. A lot of investors have been issuing the corporate bond market. Uh, issuers have been there. Second initiative that has been uh, done is we've allowed banks to issue long-term bonds in the corporate bond market. And because banks are reasonably highly rated and are, are relatively safe, that has expanded and we've sort of eliminated a variety of preemptions on those. And I think a number of banks have now taken advantage of that. I think more will as the need for financing increases. But bankruptcy code will be essential. Soon we will allow banks to um, create and enhance corporate bonds. So the notion that RBI is against corporate bonds, I think we can put to rest. And third, we are examining the possibility of repoing corporate bonds, and that will also, obviously high quality corporate bonds, but I think that will add a fillip to the corporate bond market. Sure. So Andy, I agree, two more questions. There was one hand I saw there, but I see two hands there. <laughs> we can't discriminate on the basis of gender. The lady there, and maybe there are two ladies, no, gender? Non-discrimination doesn't mean the reverse discrimination. <laughs> the lady who's got his hand up and now who's standing, and then uh, two many things. I've got Rajan Ramani here, and I know you so long. That gentleman there. Hi, uh, I'm Kalpana. I'm a lawyer by profession. Uh, two points. Uh, one, we discussed. Our, you mentioned about private equity in ARC, but uh, typically private equity look at five to seven year exit, and if you are looking at ARC, surface problem. Do you really see that private equity would be interested? And the second point was in relation to the pay time and the payment bank. Why is it that most of the times in India, regulators are more of reactive nature than proactive? So the companies have started doing, you know, almost know what they want to do, and the regulations comes after two years. Why can't we be proactive and say, okay, this is where the corporates want to go. Let's create the market for that. On uh, uh, private equity, I think there are s private equity situations that uh, uh, certainly foreign private equity uh, is looking for these situations. People like KKR uh, are trying to go into some of these distressed situations where they see value and working with a promoter, working with the banks and trying to refloat the company, uh, sometimes with additional investment. So I, I you know, five to seven years, I'd, I'm not sure what ideal time frame they're looking at, but these are turnaround situations. And I think they're willing to invest money and see them turn around and then sell uh, later on. And I would say in general, there are lots of uh, profitable possibilities. Of course, once you get the pricing right in India today, which could be turnaround situations for private equity. Uh, and so I, I would welcome more of that, whether domestic or outside. Um, you know, I mean, uh, you asked why regulators aren't proactive. We can't make regulation when it doesn't, when nothing actually exists on the ground. Uh, and in fact, I'd rather see something working for a little while and understand if there are any issues before I regulate it. <laughs> so we have been proactive in allowing uh, semi-closed wallets where a lot of these paytms and so on come. So in a sense, we encourage that process. And now we're creating the way for the next step for them, which is payment banks, allowing them to actually open accounts. So I would say on the payment side, uh, and this is not my doing, this is the uh, 
the RBI itself has been right on the forefront. We have one of the world's best RTGS systems, real-time gross settlement systems. We have, we deal with enormous volumes, volumes no other country, very few countries deal with because of the size of the payments that are made, uh, relatively smaller size, much greater volume. I think if you look at the payment side, RBI has been on the forefront. We got a lot of bad press for one thing we did, which is one entity was violating foreign exchange rules by what it was doing, and we said, no, you can't do that. If you don't like what the rules are, you petition us to change the rules, but don't violate the rules. And that is a company which has been held up for violating rules elsewhere in the world. We get a bad name in India for enforcing the rules. Mm -hmm. I think it is, uh, it, is, it is really a bad thing that the press goes on about this while not recognizing the, the importance of obeying rules when rules are there. Thank you. Who was the gentleman here? And, no, this gentleman here. And then only one last question. No, somebody here raised the hand much earlier. Who was it? Oh, you've forgotten your question now. Okay, then that gentleman there, and that will end it. I'm sorry. Yeah. Good morning, sir. Uh, Rupesh Achara from. I've got all the whole day, but you know, there are people here who want to leave apart from the governor. Yeah, I'm Rupesh Achara from IDFC. Uh, my question is about uh, physical assets versus financial assets. The trend reversal uh, has been slightly seen in 2013, and it's very important for uh, you know business which I represent is asset management business. So uh, apart from uh, obvious role of government in this. Uh, what do you think RBI's role uh, uh, in, you know, happening this, uh, these particular assets uh, growth uh, in a calibrated manner? I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, uh, domestic savings into physical assets and financial assets. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. There has been an eight-year period almost, you know, the physical right. uh, assets were growing rapidly right. and uh, financial savings, uh, financial assets actually right. lagged. Wh wh what you're talking about is that increasingly households have been investing in in home improvement, in, in uh, uh, jewelry, uh, valuables, and so on, and less in uh, financial assets such as deposits. And this is a, a complex issue, the variety of reasons, uh, one of which, for example, is the tax benefit to financial savings has gone down in real terms over time. Uh, if you look at what it was in, uh, in the early 2000s to what it is now, so that could be part of what is going on. Uh, but part of what is going on, I would also argue, is deposit rates have been strongly negative in real terms uh, for a large number of years. So as a result, people have sort of looked to physical assets to protect them against inflation. Today, with inflation coming down and real uh, returns coming into positive territory, uh, there's been some movement, slight, but some movement back into financial assets. Some of it is also driven by the buoyant stock market. So let us see. I mean, my hope is that they move more towards financial assets over time so that business can get the funding that it, that it needs. Uh, government is also moving on these gold bonds to see if uh, they can move people away from gold assets. Let us see what, what happens. The last question was our people want to leave. Please keep it short. Thank you. Introduce yourself. Thank you. Jaydeep Keval Ramani from Thomson Reuters. And my question is in connection with high value currency in contrast with what we are trying to do with uh, the payment bank for low value payments. Could you elaborate more upon the need of having high value currency notes? Currency notes? Yeah. Well, uh, there have been uh, arguments that we now carry very thick wallets uh, because we need many, many notes to make uh, ordinary payments. Uh, there's a counter argument that, uh, which has two forms. One, if you're making large payments, you should make it by electronic means. Uh, government is certainly trying to encourage that. Not only does it reduce the need for currency, which currency actually costs money to produce and distribute, but also it brings more activity into the formal uh, system. Second issue uh, against big currency notes is the incentive to forge increases. So if I have a 10,000 rupee note, the value from forging it uh, and the incentive to do all the sort of investment that is needed to get the appropriate forging devices increases. So if, you're if I forge a 10 rupee note, it's the crudest form of forgery. If I forge a 100 rupee note, it's better. 500 rupee notes, I've seen some incredibly uh, uh, good. We can still have security features that tell them apart. But I think the, the, the given that we are in a 
somewhat difficult neighborhood, uh, there is some concern about the extent of forgery that will take place if we do too large value notes. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, may I thank Antara and CII for organizing this. CK Prahlad Memorial, fourth memorial lecture, and for inviting a keynote speaker, and there could be none better. So thank you, thank you.